Welcome to Emerging Technology Horizons. I'm Dr. Mark Lewis, the Executive Director of NDIA's Emerging Technology Institute. And today we're going to be talking to Dr. Mary Ellen O'Connell, who is the Robert Marion Short Professor of Law and Research Professor of International Dispute Resolution in the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, Dr. O'Connell's work is in the areas of international law, specifically on the use of force, on international dispute resolution, and on international legal theory. She's the author or editor of numerous books, including most recently, The Art of Law in the International Community, um, and Self-Defense Against Non-State Actors, uh, uh, with Tams and Pilati, published by Cambridge University Press. Um, in fall of 2018, uh, Professor O'Connell was a visiting professor at the University of Chicago Law School. Um, in April 2018, she presented the fifth annual Justice Stephen Breyer International Law Lecture at the Brookings Institute, which is titled Autonomous Weapons and International Law, which I think will be the major topic of our conversation today. She was the vice president of the American Society of International Law and from 2005 to 2010 chaired the International Law Association Committee on the Use of Force. Uh, Professor O'Connell served as a Title X professional military educator at the U.S. Department of Defense in Germany was also an associate attorney in private practice with the law firm of Covington and Burlington in Washington, D.C. Uh, she holds uh, advanced degrees from Cambridge and uh, JD from Columbia University. So, Professor Mary Ellen O'Connell, thank you so much for joining us on this edition of our podcast. Um, I, I want to dive right in. So, what are the ethical issues, as you see them, that are raised by the use of unmanned weapon systems in armed conflict? Let's can we start, Mark, with just some basic definitions for your listeners? Um, because unmanned systems are one kind of high tech weapon. They're actually they've been in use for over twenty years now, um, and and maybe more of the ethical issues we want to talk about today are with that next generation of fully autonomous or um, uh, robotic weapons. So. They they have a lot in common, and one of those weapons technologies has really merged into the second one. It's rare for an unmanned system not to have a lot of automaticity, but it is something distinctive from what we're seeing coming online with fully autonomous robotic weapons. So an unmanned system is one that maybe is more properly called. I mean, the British, in their uh, initial legal work on these systems, called them remotely piloted systems. The most common one that many people will be familiar with from movies and other cultural uh, presentations is the drone, a remotely piloted aerial vehicle. Our first generation of drones in the U.S. Air Force used the Hellfire missile. It was a launch system for the Hellfire missile, which was a, a ground-launched type of munition designed for killing tanks. Those That system of drones got its first use in the um, war against Afghanistan following 9-11, the first actual kill operation in that armed conflict. And then the U.S. started using drones outside armed conflict zones. Already in November 2002, the first known um, targeted killing using a drone-launched Hellfire missile was in Yemen against six individuals, including a U.S. citizen, a 23-year-old man. We've been using these systems so since um, 2021, uh, or since, since uh, uh, 2001, and uh, coming up to the 20th anniversary of using them outside of armed conflict zones. I have had real ethical problems, of course, using a military weapon outside an armed conflict zone. Anytime that you use a use of military force, not under the rules of the UN Charter, not under the rules of the Geneva Convention, you are in serious violation of international law and you help to undermine that set of rules that should be governing all of the international community. And I'm seeing increasing repercussions of having failed to comply with those rules by the United States. What led to the decay of those rules to the point where Russia thinks it's not a problem to invade its neighbor and attempt to conquer Ukraine. But that's the main problem with 
unmanned systems. There is a human being who's operating those, certainly the traditional drone and the follow-on technologies for land-based unmanned systems, sea-based unmanned systems. They have a human being who's actually able to make the kill decision. They're, the old systems were just using a, a joystick and there was a button that, that the operator would press and that would launch the missile at the target that that operator was watching through their camera feed. Still, there was something about that technology that led already President Bush and then his, his three successors to use that munition unlawfully. If we go to the ethical issues with um, completely autonomous systems, we see another layer of concerns, an even deeper layer of ethical concerns. Right now, you, there's a lot of, of, of ability for a, a, an unmanned system operator to lock on to a target, to use certain criteria, feed it into the computer, and let the system operate on its own without making the kill decision in the moment. So we've been moving closer and closer to what um, uh, uh, ethicists and scientists would tell us is full um, autonomy of these weapons. You won't need a human operator at all. And in fact, some of the scientists tell me that you'll be able to program the, the machine, the launch vehicle, to deploy its weapons months, years after the initial release of the weapon. That raises a whole new level of ethical issues because then it's the machine doing the selection of the target as well as the execution of the target. And there are at least two very serious ethical problems with a machine making the decision to kill. Um, first, and, and now I'm going to quote from the um, uh, the Holy See's position. There is a, a set of ongoing negotiations about the legality of weapons that take place in Geneva under the auspices of the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons. And they have been debating since 2013 whether fully autonomous robotic weapons, these weapons that don't need a human being to make the selection decision whether to carry out a, a killing operation, a military operation or not, talking about it for nine years, Russia and the United States have been making common cause to prevent a ban on these autonomous weapons, but the Vatican has been very clear in what are the ethical issues at stake with these weapons. And I'm just going to quote from their um, statement, decisions over life and death inherently call for human qualities, such as compassion and insight to be present. While imperfect human beings may not perfectly apply such qualities in the heat of war, these qualities are never replaceable nor programmable. In other words, there's a certain uh, question of a human being's human dignity to be killed by another human, not a machine, the way we kill animals that are now increasingly killed by robots at, at slaughterhouses. But there's a second ethical and legal objection we have a whole set of rules governing the use of military force known as international humanitarian law or the laws of armed conflict. And these make it really impossible for a system that does not have a human being involved in the kill decision because we have rules that every battlefield operation must be overseen by a responsible commander. Target selection and the manner of attack cannot evade oversight and command and control of a human being. The commander has to have full contextual and situational awareness of every operation that those serving under him carry out. The ability to perceive unexpected change in circumstances, the retention of power to suspend or abort the attack, and time for deliberation on the significance of the attack before it's carried out all by a human being, a human commander who's ultimately has command responsibility. So Marianne, if I could, if I could pick at that a little bit. Sure. Though. If I launch a mortar round, shooting it over the horizon, right, once I launch it, it's going to hit a target. And arguably, if I've got some autonomous system, maybe artificial intelligence, it can actually identify, is, a target, is that the target I'm really supposed to be hitting or not, and abort in a way that a mortar round can't. 
or that a rocket can. Um, I guess I'd liken it, you know, there was a, there's been a lot of criticism about collateral damage caused by unmanned aircraft. And I, frankly, I'd argue that a lot of that was what came to the forefront for the very reason that those unmanned aircraft have an extra level of scrutiny, that there are cameras on board, we're doing battlefield damage assessment. So you get the image that, oops, I hit something I wasn't trying to hit, which I don't want to make light of. That's obviously very important. Whereas if I launch the mortar round over the horizon, or if I launch the rocket over the horizon, if I do the indiscriminate launch over the horizon, I have no idea that I hit something I wasn't wasn't aiming at. How, how did how, do, how, do, how would you respond to that? Mark, you have a lot of assumptions packed into your mortar round example. And as you presented, it sounds easy. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be done better by a machine. But you're already assuming and your listeners will assume that you're in a battlefield context where there's a defined enemy, where there's a commander who's made a decision that this is a proper target. And now we're going to use which of these uh, machines to determine, well, it may be better in that situation on a battlefield in hostilities where there is a known enemy and you already have a strategic level understanding of what military necessity requires in order to win the uh, military objective. In that situation, it might be preferable to send a drone with a camera over the horizon, but then the human dignity of the target, of the human target, or even the natural environment still deserves a human conscience. So, you, so we can potentially uh, use our technology to fight better, but only when you continue to include these certain parameters of law. And that requires that you've had a human decision making in determining what are the, all those uh, um, uh, prerequisites that we just talked about. Think about the scenario with, with the fully autonomous robotic system. Yeah, they might be really precise, but it's making its own decision about what is the war? What is the military objective? What is the target? A machine. So yeah, they made, they, the machine may make decisions that are very accurate for the machine's decision on what are its objectives. I mean, we're hearing from uh, the technologists who, who work with you all the, every day that they don't know what these learning technologies are gonna come up with. It's a black box. We can set up the algorithm, but if, by the fact that it's learning, we human beings who start the system, who invent it, don't know where it's gonna end up. But I, I might argue that if I'm looking for, say, a particular target, that we're getting to the point where a machine algorithm might be better at doing a precise identification of that target than a human operator. Uh, for example, we're seeing artificial intelligence applied in the medical field where it's being shown that uh, AI can do diagnostics on, say, an X-ray or a CAT scan and do a better job of, of identifying, say, a tumor than the human could. S same idea approaching uh, applying to the battlefield. Absolutely the opposite idea. The technology you just talked about is to save life. The technology with weapons is to take life. We have to put a whole layer of legal, ethical, and moral limits on what we can do with AI in the killing field as in the saving and healing fields. This is a major divide. This distinction is being lost, Mark. And that's why I think we are in such ethical peril these days and why we're seeing so many unethical uses of, of violent technologies of killing. We've lost the idea that death, the, t the intentional taking of a life, is always a last resort. This is the most fundamental of ethical teachings in every major religion, in every ethical system. Life to defend another life immediately, in the moment, is all that we've ever permitted, certainly in Christianity, certainly in other major ethical codes. But we have begun to expand what we think is our right to lead a certain kind of life, to have a certain level of security, so that we are deploying these technologies to get an advantage, to be able to kill before the others kill us, to preempt. This has become the standard notion within security and why we're inventing systems that can kill more rapidly or without a human being even deciding. And that's where we're getting into trouble. If so, you're going to, go ahead. Yeah. No, I was gonna say, so, so along those lines though, and, and I, I love your thoughts on this. So uh, let me take the hypothetical. Um, if I have identified say, a terrorist, and I know that that individual is about to carry out a major attack 
that could result in the death of tens, hundreds, thousands. Uh, if we if we had been able to get information before Osama bin Laden launched the attack on the World Trade Center, would we not have been uh, uh, on the ethical high ground to take him out before he does that? Mark, again, you're making assumptions about the scenario that are not what is being forecast for AI weapons, for weapons with learning capacity. You say we. You're talking about human beings. If we'd had intelligence, what would be the right... Um, uh, technology for us to d employ. In fact, the, the, where I was going to go with what we should be doing, where the analogy to healing really does come in and, and should have been part of what was going on in the, in the days leading up to 9-11, because remember, we had plenty of intelligence. We just didn't act on it. And we'd had intelligence about Al-Qaeda and what Al-Qaeda was capable of from 1998 and the Clinton administration, but we failed to take any of the defensive measures, the good policing measures, for which we had great prior evidence uh, from, from how Europeans dealt with really uh, embedded um, uh, terrorist organizations. Just look at the uh, IRA around for 20 more years, killed so many people, and yet the British used the rule of law, and that's how they finally defused the IRA. We've never done that with Al Qaeda, and they're still around. So we are we are failing to take. We are constantly in America because we are uh, um, seduced by our technology that we think we can get ahead of the game, use that technology, and not do the old-fashioned things, the careful work, and focus on true defense. That's what I would love to see in the AI field: is not how we invent the next more rapid way of killing but the way to diffuse and to defend against the weapons that are being created by others in which they try to get an advantage over us in, in this rapidly developing competitive field. Yes, but, and yet, as, as, you, as you point out, I, I think correctly, that uh, the genie is effectively out of the bottle. We have peer competitors who are developing artificial intelligence. Um, you know, how, how, do we, how do we counter that? without developing our own capabilities. So we, we've already confronted this with other kinds of, of um, unlawful weapons. We have successfully banned the use of chemical weapons. We have successfully banned the use of biological weapons. We have not done as well on nuclear weapons in part because the nuclear weapons possessors won't give them up the way we were willing to do with chemical and biologicals. But I would treat AI weapons the same way. And it's not that we didn't, you know, that the United States, for example, didn't think other countries were going to have these. Um, we've seen that, that they were used in Syria. So they, chemical weapons are still in existence. There's and, some and fear Russia, that and Russia is still. Apparently. Russia might yes. in, in Ukraine. So what, how has the United States dealt with the chemical weapons issue? Not by creating its own chemical weapons, but by creating defenses. My husband served in the Gulf War. He was in the front lines. He was the most forward deployed interrogator. He received his inoculations against potential anthrax and other, other weapons that could be used against him. He had his gas mask. What we could have done even better if we put our, the R&D into defending against these weapons as opposed to creating new ones. And, 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 and that's exactly where I think the emphasis in, in, the, in the cyber field and in the AI field absolutely should go. The United States should be diffusing every invention that any one of these dictators or um, leaders of, of, of terrorist organizations have come up with. In, in this area, I truly think a good defense is a good defense. We need to get out of that old realist militarist mindset that you know we're gonna stay one step ahead of everyone with the next weapon. That's a fool's game. The, the, as you said, the technology's out there. When we released Stuxnet, for example, um, on, uh, on uh, Iran to try to diffuse their, their um, undermine their weapons program or their nuclear program, they still say, and we don't really have evidence they're building a weapon, but the Iranians were able to reverse engineer that um, virus, the Stuxnet, and use it against others. They used a form of it, an even more lethal form, against the Israelis. 
the uh, that that was a ridiculous thing for us to do to give that kind of uh, malicious cyber um, uh, where to to Iran. What we should have been doing is really uh, in, uh, creating the best defenses so that no one can get at our um, technology. That's what we should be doing for Ukraine right now, too. And, and yet there are some weapons that we may, simply may not be able to defend effectively against. Um, what are we doing? Right, like places? nuclear weapons. Like nuclear. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, exactly. It, how does it help? How does it help to create yet a better nuclear weapon? There, there's only one real answer. First, we do need to defend as well as we can. We need to come up with the defenses. Right now, our defense against nuclear is based on offense. And this is part of the mindset that that got established in the 1950s of mutually assured destruction instead of mutually assured security, mutually assured defense. That's what the D should be for. And so we're, we're, we're decades away from where we should be on creating the true defense to nuclear so that it's no longer uh, a threat to us. Yeah. Well, as, as you know, we've, best we've, way... we've had the Missile Defense Agency... Right. Years. So we've got yeah. some defenses. We've got some defenses, and that's great. Mm -hmm. Anything you can do with technology, and this is this is the this is the, to me the future. Defense, healing, prevention—that is all great. Not preemption, not offense, and and that's where I would put the U.S.'s vast technology. And look at all the countries that would want to buy it. It it would be amazing, and the spinoff positive technologies instead of these negative tech, uh, uh, um, uh, norms and ways of thinking that have resulted in this world of vast armed conflict and, and killing even in so, our schools. So, so let me ask this um, question. So what what would a ban mean? Would that mean you have to have humans in the loop, as some have advocated, or, or something beyond that? I think a ban has to have two really firm aspects to it. The first would be toward building again, the norm against violence, the norm prohibiting the use of force, prohibiting killing, um, except in true self-defense. So a ban needs to reiterate that and really begin to rebuild, get us out of this video game mentality where winning is killing as many as you can, losing is uh, not, you know, there's, there's no, no good in failing to defend yourself. So that has to be part that normative rebuilding of ethics is, so is imperative actually, I, I, to get together with yeah yeah let me just yeah. finish my second point on what we need yeah. in a ban it has to, it must have a human being making the actual kill decision and any decision and so some of our technology has to be re-engineered to fit a ban that would be developed for um fully autonomous robotic weapons, and that is ending automaticity, always having before impact the ability to so abort. So I, I will tell you, having spent many years working in the Pentagon and the DOD, I don't think I've ever met anyone who defines winning as killing as many as possible. No, and I didn't say that that's what the Pentagon yeah. is thinking. I said that's become our video game yeah. mentality widely as a culture. And this, this whole idea of success being connected with killing. But yeah. remember, Mark, how did we define success in the Vietnam War? Four years, the body count of the enemy. And in fact, we were losing that war. How did we, you know, we've, we've talked about, we don't, now we don't talk about how many we killed. For example, people do not know how many died as a result of the 2003 invasion of Iraq yeah. because we plainly lost that conflict and nobody wants to add to that the numbers but can killed. But we define, can we, we define success in the Cold War? as having prevented ever from having the nuclear exchange that we all feared. So so we avoided we avoided that worst case scenario. That is yeah. true. And I I confirm that. On the other hand, I often like to play the counterfactual. What would have happened if we had gone for the Baruch plan and shared technology uh, right away and diffused the whole competitive advantage in having more and more secret nuclear information, what if we had really committed to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and begun to uh, dismantle and create systems of defense, not systems of potential offense? I think that, that, that we can't replay that now, but one of the great lessons of Russia's invasion of Ukraine is that our 
principles and our ethics, our norms, our rules, the UN Charter basic rule set up in the wake of two world wars, the prohibition on the use of force, needs rebuilding. And that's where we have to start. Regardless of what happened 30 years ago in the Cold War, that's not going to work now. We have to rebuild what's been torn down during the post-Cold War So period. I would say, I, I think we actually kind of did the experiment. What happens when we we rely on a, an agreement to disarm, to dismantle? Of course, as you mentioned, we banned biological weapons, and yet we know now that the Russians continued their work in secret. So it's it's... First, they at least had to go into yeah. secret. It was no longer acceptable to do this in, in yeah. open. Second, you always have to prepare for the law mm -hmm. breaker. But the best way to prepare, there's two, and that's what I'm emphasizing today. You only prepare for the law breaker by continuing to make it clear who is the law breaker, by having those strong norms against doing what the Russians have done. And then second, you prepare your defense so that in the case that the lawbreaker acts, you have a way to defend yourself. But it doesn't help in either of those two pillars of how we create a law-abiding community, world community. If you're loosening up the rules all the time because you want to be able to take your own advantage and use military force, as the U.S. has been doing with drone strikes, Continually. Did you know that in, in 2019, the United States used, I'm sorry, 2020, the United States used, attacked Somalia 60 times with drones from January to December. That country is now facing almost a third of their population is going to starve to death in the coming months. It's, it, 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 this is no way for the United States to set up norms for rules-based international order, an order of peace in which the climate can finally flourish, in which we have alternatives to war for the resolution of disputes. It, it, it won't be easy. We've, we've really descended so far. We've decayed these principles so deeply. We have to start somewhere. We don't leave ourselves open completely, of course, to risk because we're constantly creating the next technology of defense. And that does not mean preemptive. So Mary Ellen, um, our, our time is almost up. I, I really want to thank you for coming. As, as you can tell, I, I disagree with a lot of what you say, but I really do appreciate your joining us and, and sharing your views. And I think it's useful for, for, for wherever we fall on the side for, for, for us to cons consider all the, all the different perspectives on an issue such as this. And, and <laughs> Well, I hope you and I will stay in conversation because I'd like to, uh, I, I'd like to help you see more and, the and case maybe, that I'm maybe I can to make convince here. you a little bit of the value of deterrence as well. I mean, one of the one of the reasons we set up the Emerging Technologies Institute is to focus on maintaining technological advantage. I I happen to believe that that the United States actually never wants a fair fight. We always want to be so superior that there's no fight to begin with. That's uh, a perspective that I come from. Well, I think those technologies can put us in a position to be so ahead in our defense that nobody wants to attack us. Not sending the fear and message that we will destroy you, but that you can't get through our excellent defenses and that we will help you to build the kind of country you want to be without attacking us. I'm good with both. I, I'm, I'm very good with both. Ma uh, Professor Mary, Mary Ellen O'Connor, thank you again so much for joining us. I really appreciate your thoughts on, on this subject. And, and I would like to stay engaged. Great. Um, I, I think it will be a, a fascinating ongoing discussion. Okay. Thanks, Mark.